You're listening to Our Common Ground with Janice Graham. Transforming truth to power, one broadcast at a time. I'm Janice Graham, and I'll be listening for you. This is an excerpt of The Visit by Dr. Tommy J. Curry on Our Common Ground, September 21st, 2013. Then wants us to sing God bless America. No, no, no. Not God bless America. God. Our Common Ground with Janice Graham. Our Common Ground. Speaking truth to power and ourselves. Our Common Ground, a higher ground for discourse, discussion, solutions, and ideas. I'm Janice Graham, and I'll be listening for you. Talk, talk, that matters. 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 Transforming truth truth to power. 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 One broadcast 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 at a time. And now to Our Common Ground with Janice Graham. Some sense of that as we talk with Dr. Curry tonight, people. And here we are, 150 years or so after he wrote these things. The masses of black people are still enslaved. But that slavery haven't taken a new form, and the black masses are in a different position. We are now concentrated in the strategic urban cores of the United States, in the most exploited sections of the working class, with the least stake in upholding the system and preserving the present order. And yet, we are still not free. Our guest tonight, Dr. Tommy J. Curry, is a professor of philosophy at Texas A&M University. His work spans across the various fields of philosophy, jurisprudence, Africana studies, and gender studies. Though he was trained in American and continental philosophical traditions, his primary research interests are in critical race theory and Africana philosophy. Uh, In his work, on critical race theories, Curry really concentrates on the work on the work of Derrick Bell. And most of you who have followed our common ground re- recognize that not only was Derrick Bell one of my mentors, he was my friend, and uh, I respected his work and his life so very much. And um, the work of Dr. Curry looks at Bell's uh, theory of racial realism as an antidote to the proliferating discourses of racial idealism. And tonight with him, we're going to be talking about racial, racial realism and racial idealism. And we're going to be talking about it in the context of black political empowerment. We're going to be talking about black liberation and social justice and race in America. And it is my pleasure uh, to talk with you, Dr. Tommy J. Curry. Thank you so much for joining us on Our Common Ground. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Let me ask you, 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 I mean, one of the things that I have, I have read so much over the last month uh, of what you have written, and you have been writing since you were an undergraduate student. I have. Tell us a little about your young life and, and your younger life uh, <laughs> and, and what led you uh, to study uh, critical race theory and philosophy. Well, philosophy was kind of a second thought. I mean, uh, I grew up in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and I grew up during a period of time where the world was still pretty segregated. So understanding race and racism really became a way to understand the world. You had to understand what side of the track you could go on and what track you could. 
And my mom always had to fill out out of zone forms for us to go to some of the better schools, which were always white schools. And you had to deal with the pressures and the kind of resentment you get from not only white students but white teachers as well. So growing up in that type of environment, which was extremely race conscious, uh, critical race theory became a way for me to understand and express uh, a lot of the sentiments I had. Uh, I picked up the argument when I started going to debate camp and doing summer research, and I ran into the work of Bell. I was about 12 years old then, so I started reading Bell and critical race theory and critical legal studies, kind of as the basis of you know competing in uh, high school debate. But as I read it more, I understood more, and I kind of carried it all the way through my college career. So when I got to college, you know, I went on a debate scholarship. Race and racism really became my focus. It wasn't just uh, complaining about racism or identifying um, aspects of American society that were racist. It was trying to figure out the racial logics, how societies are structured, how laws and economics are utilized to keep certain groups of people uh, in subservient positions. And from that, it really kind of, you know, got me to anti-colonial literature, uh, led me to write my dissertation on Derrick Bell. And in that, you know, I got a different understanding. I think a lot of times we approach critical race theory and any other kind of racial discourse um, as a tax. We use it as a way to uh, pick out certain things in the world that we're dissatisfied from, uh, with. And I think we should, but what I was interested in doing was trying to figure out how certain ideologies and logics were working. I kept seeing the same relationships. You know, where I grew up, you never saw black teachers or black people own business. What you saw were black people working for white people. You know, and this in and Louisiana, Lake Charles isn't a big city. So back then, you know, black people either worked in kitchens or they worked, you know, in the hospitals. But you never saw independent black businesses. I was like, why? What What is it about the world that's structured in a way that black people always end up at the bottom? So that's what led me there. When I was an undergrad, I had the opportunity to write uh, some columns for our uh, newspaper in Southern Illinois, The Daily Egyptian. And uh, <laughs> it didn't go over so well with some of the white folk. Uh, but it was a popular column. It ran for about three years. And, uh, you know, there you really saw the reactions that white people had. You know, you make the mistake sometimes of being of growing up in the South that, oh, if you come up north, you know, things will be better. You know, you hear that the north is more liberal, the north has more opportunities. But I was getting, you know, photos with uh, Klan crosses burning on them. I was constantly getting, um, you know, emails calling me a nigger, telling me to go back to Africa. So, you know, that kind of that solidified my view about the racist character and nature of America in itself. Well, let me, uh, as you went through all this, and it's really interesting because you are probably one of five or six people that I have interviewed over my career who are outstanding uh, race scholars. Uh, I appreciate who, it. Thank you. <laughs> and, that, and, that, and that includes Dr. John Henry Clark. All of yeah. these people were debaters, which which means that they were um, – thinkers. Right. And they were researchers. Uh and and it it really strikes me as interesting that uh you fall in the same path as people like I mean Dr. Naeem Akbar was um a a champion award-winning debater when he was uh-huh. a student at FAMU. Uh Hakim Adebudi was a debate coach at the University of Chicago for many, many years. So uh, it, it's really interesting that um, that you come from that genre of thinkers because you really yeah. have to be able to defend what you say. And some of these knuckleheads running around who never have to defend, they say outrageous stuff, which is based in absolute nonsense, and most of them – are part of the Congress of this United States, and they never have to defend anything that they have to say. But right. tell us, coming out of and, and 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 Lake Charles is really the Deep South. Yes. Uh, yeah. As you moved outside of what sounds like a very nurturing environment, what were your first impressions of yourself as a black man? in a new environment. Well, that's tough. I mean, you know, I left I left Lake Charles and the South really, you know, I didn't I got scholarships to LSU and Emory. Uh but I, I wanted to leave the South because at a very young age I, I, I already understood that this is not a place for black people to be. You know, and I went to you know, I went to good schools. I went to the schools where, you know, as I said, my mom 
was always in charge of, you know, the, the out-of-zone slips. And, you know, my dad supported us, you know, doing well in our education. So I saw other opportunities, but I realized very quickly that they track they track black men in the South. You know, even when I was debating, you know, they would, they would tell me that niggers can't debate. You know, I'll never forget that. I was at a tournament in, uh, in Alexandria. You know, so there there was I, I saw these things and I didn't want to be trapped in that. So coming out of it, you know, I was extremely race conscious. You know, when I went to uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, initially, I just started debating. I took that race consciousness with me. I was in a new environment. I said, okay, well, let's try this out. You know, all, only black debater on the team. You know, and what I saw was that the difference between the South and the North wasn't really in the degree of racism; it was just in the organization of it. Down south, people knew what side of the track you're from. It's a segregated logic, right? Black people on one side, white people on the other. In the north, it's this idea that you can talk down to black people, that they naturally stay in their place. There weren't any real national champion debaters, you know, when I started in 97. There were very few that were debating at the collegiate level. Uh, so it was a very hostile environment. You had to be intellectually aggressive uh, to even survive in that type of environment. So coming from the race-conscious background that I did, I survived off the fact that I was coping through my disdain for white people. So I saw them as enemies. I saw them as people that I had to overcome, not only because of their racism, but because of the whiteness of the sport. And it's kind of the organization of knowledge. I mean, when you go to University of Missouri, Kansas City, it's still an all-white uh, campus, even though it's a commuter campus. In fact, it was because of the racism of the team um, under Collier back then that I actually left that team and transferred to Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. And that was despite me winning a national championship for University of Missouri, Kansas City. The racism of the sport uh, made me kind of decide that there was I needed to go to another path and hopefully uh, find black teammates. Uh, but I got to Southern Illinois. Case wasn't much different. I brought them a national championship as well. Brought in, They had a racist coach. I decided, look, this is not what I'm going to do. So I focused all my energies uh, into my academics. And I think that the eye-opening thing for me, at least, was that nothing changes. I mean, this is really where Bell spoke to me, you know, especially being a black man. There wasn't, there wasn't, you know, I know sisters got it bad, too, so I don't put that, you know, uh, not trying to take anything away from their experiences. But on the other hand, as a black man, you feel isolated in the academy. You you see black men that come in, drop out the next year. You see brothers that are in school, but they're all athletes. You know, it's very it's very difficult to find colleagues and peers uh, in the academy. And then when you see the racism and how it's organized, where people try to de-radicalize you and they try to threaten you and they tell you if you read this or you say that, you won't graduate, you won't get a job, or people don't perceive you as intelligent, those, those things with, with Bell's work really started clicking for me. It really let me see that racism at its very essence is, is a permanent structure, not only of society, but people, the, the logic and psychology that white people use to understand and interact with black folk. So it's kind of from there that I really did, you know, kind of build up this, you know, this aggressive intellectual posture. You know, I was like, I'm going to read everything. Every time that someone says anything about black people or they half do or half research it, I was going to attack them for that, for disrespecting and erasing the actual knowledge of black people. And I think that uh, I've kind of lived up to that early uh, 17-year-old <laughs> kid's uh, idea of what an intellectual or black intellectual would look like. Now, now tell us, uh, if you would, the kinds of courses that you are teaching at Texas A&M. Yeah, well, at Texas A&M, I'm trying to restructure uh, the pedagogy. I'm trying to restructure the curricula. Uh, as is usually the case in philosophy departments, I'm the only black philosopher we have. Uh, you know, and the history of the program has been around since the 60s. They've hired three black people, uh, and I'm the only one that's left uh, – and, and still dealing with the racism at Texas A&M. So the, tri the kinds of courses I teach are really designed uh, to be an earth-shattering experience. Uh, right now I teach uh, hip-hop philosophy on the undergraduate level, uh, introduction to uh, Africana philosophy, studies in Africana philosophy from 1770 to 1900. And that course is about uh, mostly intellectual history. I'm trying to show that African-descended people all the way from the 1700s, late 1700s, uh, hundreds have always been interested in the notion of freedom. And I think that sometimes when we get caught up in academic language, we try to talk about how black people have had experiences of marginalization, X, Y, and Z. I'm not really interested in that kind of post-colonial or post-structuralist discourse. 
I'm interested in how black people saw themselves as enslaved and thought themselves out of enslavement. I'm interested in how they uh, tried to take different intellectual journeys, be it through immigration or political activism or separatism or uh, social contact or even uh, revolutionary violence, tried to free themselves, even look into Haiti. So I'm really interested in how black people thought themselves free from that period of time. And then I teach a course on radical black philosophies of race and racism. And that course really articulates the anti-colonial logics of how black people think. I think sometimes when we teach black courses or race courses or Africana studies courses, we get so caught up in the descriptive nature and the biographical nature of black people in history that we forget that black people actually gave us constructive cultural thinking patterns, constructive logics, reconstructive political ideas that allow us to think out, think through our situation in ways that a lot of scholars don't want to do because it puts our jobs and it puts our uh, collegiality uh, on the chopping block. But in that course, I try to highlight some of the ways that W.B. Du Bois, for example, tried to educate black children through the Brownies books and what he actually saw as being the uh, revolutionary project, not in terms of politics, but in terms of educating our people into self-conscious liberation. Or we talk about the Black Panther Party, not as a black nationalist organization, but as a black radical uh tradition or theoretical organization that really sought to change the way that we understand things like racism or classism and economic exploitation and sexuality. I think some of the works that are coming out from Greg Thomas and, of course, the work of Sylvia Winter really does change the way that we need to look at black radical thought in ways that the county is just not ready for. And on the grad level, of course, I do critical race theory, W.B. Du Bois, and anti-colonial thought, just building off of those ideas. But I'm really trying to formulate courses and curricula that are based on the intellectual heritage of African descent of people. My course is pretty much like no white folks allowed. I'm not interested in how white people think about black people. I'm interested in how black people think about themselves and starting from that position to debate whether or not the ideas are valid or not. You, you do a lot of... Um of teaching of young black people, how is it making a difference? How will it inform, influence where we are as a people? Well, I mean, I think I think the the task when you're educating African descended people, especially young black people, is well from this generation uh, is is actually ironic. Is that you're you're teaching them that racism still exists outside of people's prejudices. Uh, over the last five to ten years, I've really seen that there's a growth in this idea that racism's kind of faded away, that you know there's racist people, but there's not really a racist system. That's old school. That's segregation. So I think when we talk about educate, or at least when I try to educate black people, I'm trying to educate them into understanding the organization of the world. And I think we miss the boat on a lot of stuff. Today, when we educate black people, like I said, it's either historical or we try to educate people into ideologies. So we want to say, oh, I'm pro-structuralist. Oh, I'm Afro-pessimist. Oh, I'm black feminist, right? We educate people into political ideologies, and they spit that off like parrots. But what we have not done is told people how to think for yourselves and dig from the intellectual history of black people to revolutionize and explain your own existence. So when I educate black students, I'm trying to get them to explain their own existence. And the reason I do that is that because those students can become lawyers or they can become doctors or they can become social workers or sociologists or politicians that fundamentally understand how to think about black existence. They don't just take on some party line and from that when it doesn't, when it's not popular anymore, have to get rid of it. I'm interested in how are people seeing the world? How are they learning to think about race? How are they understanding the changing dynamics? I mean, racism certainly changed. I mean, we got Obama in the office now, and we still have more racial violence, et cetera. How do you explain that? If you don't have a neo-colonial model, if you don't have a model that understands the fundamental anti-nature of uh, our anti-human nature of blackness and racism, then it's become hard for you to identify having a black president and still having black oppression if you're just coming from a post-civil rights or integrationist mindset. So with my students, I try to, I try to make them sharp. I, try, I encourage intellectual disagreement. I encourage them to disagree with me and disagree with you know, black text because they have to learn to think through problems. They have to learn to think through their own problems and the things they encounter in the world. And I think that's a shortcoming in the way that not only we do pedagogy, but especially how we try to do black pedagogy or Africana pedagogy. We teach people to respect certain histories and heritages, but we don't teach them to respect the disagreements and what grows out of disagreements with different black intellectual figures. We, we give them on repetitive mode. It's rote memorization. And I think that takes people too, it puts them too far in the box. It confines them, right, because it, it makes it seem as if 
our people are only interesting to the aspect that we we identify like oh I'm nonviolent too I identify with Martin Luther King or I think we should take up guns I'm Malcolm X that's a cliff nose version of African descended people's intellectual heritage but when you start talking about the revolutionary nature of Black studies and what it should have done before it was co-opted by you know the Ford Foundation or co-opted by post-structuralist language or co-opted uh, or, or when it was co-opted by Ivy League institutions that are a bit more about representational politics and economic games for Ivy League professors rather than making a connection to explain the life and the suffering of African descended people on the ground level, then you can understand, well, why you need to be suspect of your education. You know, instead of just learning the idea of Carter G. Woodson that education itself is bankrupt, you understand that Carter G. Woodson is making a, a critique of bourgeois black intellectuals who become miseducated because they seek to imitate white society and because they want recognition by white society. And when the uneducated masses who they criticize somehow become demonized, it's the uneducated people who are trying to build up economic bases and political bases and activism within black communities. But we lose all that under our present structure of African education and education, period, because we teach black students who want to be representative, to be recognized by white people, to be recognized by white institutions, to go to Ivy League schools, which I have no problem with, but don't come out to Ivy League school thinking you're like the white person that built the Ivy League school that's fundamentally anti-black, right? So I try to I try to give my, my students some nuance. I try to uh, not liberate but revolutionize their minds so they can think about new ways of liberation that I can't see yet because, you know, that's why we all die. Sometimes we, out, we outlive our usefulness, but... I'm hoping that with the students that I that I teach and the ways that we ask questions and debate and have disagreements, that that sets them on a path to find new answers and ask new questions I can't see in my lifetime. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One of the things that you do is you set the foundation for uh, a, a new progressive type of black-oriented determination because I think one of the things that we um, – suffer from in in as a people is that we have begun to think that determination decides who makes it out of the ghetto Mm -hmm. uh now that's a tired old cliche at its worst on every level because this is looking at millions of people being put through a meat grinder and instead of focusing on the fact that the great majority uh, are are chewed pieces concentrating insta- instead on the few who slip through. And that has created, in my mind, a pressure cooker for us mm-hmm. to figure out where we are going uh, today in this quote-unquote post-racial era now that we have elected a, uh, a, a, a African-American president. Let me ask you about your notion. You do a lot of writing about racial idealism. What mm-hmm. do you mean by that? Well, I actually get that term <clears throat> from some of the literature in critical race theory. Now, uh, Richard Delgado makes a distinction between what – <laughs> I don't know how to put it nicely – what race crits were when they were reading Derrick Bell, the Black Panthers, Martin Luther King, and revolutionary thought, and what race crits have become imitating the continental discourse of white intellectuals like Foucault, Derrida, Agamben, etc. And what I mean by racial idealism is kind of is twofold. One is the hope that you can change your oppressor, that in engaging your oppressor, in talking to them, in pointing out their racism, that they'll change. The other aspect of that, the other signification of, of, of that term, is that it means utilizing discursive theories to deal with structural inequalities. In other words, speaking about racism or using certain rhetoric to talk about racism as if that rhetoric will fundamentally change the way that the actual world is organized. And I have a problem with racial idealism because, again, I think that it's the – de-radicalized notion. It's the building of caricature. It's the tokenism of black intellectual figures that is so rewarded in the academy today. So when I attack idealism, I'm attacking a pattern of thought that has come about 
in order to assimilate and co-opt radical black thinking like Bell's critical race theory, like anti-colonial thought that says, oh, if we just engage white people and teach white people how to think better or how to think about their whiteness, then we've solved the problem of racism. In my work, I call that critical race therapy because every black person that goes to graduate school now is trained to be a racial therapist. We're trained to want to engage white people and want our work and our conversations to be recognized by them. So they say we're good people, and the flip side of that is when they recognize us and can deal with our work, we then become allies with them to say if anyone accuses them of racism, we're right there to say, no, 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 they're not racist because they have X, Y, and Z conversations, or they cite my work so clearly they can't be racist. It's a it's a bourgeois and it's an elitist system that gets us to inevitably buy into the to the careers of white folks as the way to kind of accelerate through the academy. I think racial idealism is not only false, but I mean it's it's a particular incantation. It's a it's a imagining of a world that says that the only job of black intellectuals is not to educate their own people, but to educate white people into anti racism. And I think that's just a lost battle. Now you compare that to racial realism. Right, what Derek Bell was talking about. This is where you get the racism as permanent thesis. Right, that if you look at an internal colonization model, or if you even look at the star decisis and decisions that you get out of the Supreme Court, you're going to see that there's this inevitable cyclical nature to how black rights and black progress and black economic games are rationalized throughout the country. You make a little progress and you get a lot pulled back. You make a little gain, you get a lot pulled back. You get one symbol and then there's a backlash, right? And I think that Derek Bell's work, at least in that regard, resonates so well because this is the same conclusion that you even got liberal black folk uh, like Ralph Bunch, you know, talking about in the 60s with blackism. Or this was the conclusion to Martin Luther King's, uh, you know, where do we go from here, chaos or community, when he's calling for revolution of values, or even Du Bois, even though he's grossly misrepresented today in the academy, when he says, look, you know, in the adre- uh, his address to the black community in 75, posthumously, he's like, look, do we really want to buy into a system where we allow our oppressor to educate our children into their own, to the idea that these white people in America is virtuous despite what they've done to the Negro? I think Bell is pulling from this, right? I mean, now there's, of course, other writings like, you know, um, Huey P. News' dissertation, The War on the Panthers, or, you know, Angela Davis' early work before, before she became a feminist and reformist. All those things point to the same idea, that you're not going to educate the oppressed out of existence, right? That's George Jackson. So if we understand that idea, if we understand that there's a structure at work here, that there are economic and political machinations that utilize individuals and universities and curricula and pedagogy all for the same end, then I think, you know, it's pretty safe to say that talking to people in their own language, in their own institutions, through their own venues like journals or conferences is not going to undo the historical and institutional realities of anti-blackness simply because you've decided that if you talk like your oppressor, that your oppressor is going to listen to you and have a change of heart. It's a a silly notion. And the only reason I can see it catching on is exactly for what the racial realists say. There's a need to keep order and stability even in the production of knowledge in universities. So the way that you do that is you trick black people into becoming the bourgeois. You, you, You trick them into saying, if you look like us, sound like us, even if you say things that criticize us, we control you. You don't have you don't find black intellectuals talking about racism in post-structuralist ways or psychoanalytic language threatening because they're still talking about Freud or they're still talking about Foucault or they're still talking about Kristeva or rigor you, you know all these white people who remain the figurehead of theory but you have someone that really talks about George Jackson or really talks about Ida B. Wells, or talks about T. Thomas Fortune, and the reason why revolutionary violence may or radical self-defense is important, or Robert F. Williams, then you have a different conversation. The academy and the academic world reacts differently to them. So I think that the racial realist who understands the racism is permanent and the kind of economic and sexual politics and uh, reproductions involved with that are much more threatening than racial idealists who just want to sound pretty and act like they have unique insights into the world because they manipulate certain European ideas explain black existence. But, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is that since Reconstruction, and especially I am a child of the 60s, -hmm. and uh, a product of the 60s, and one of uh, the mission of black people as revolutionary people was Mm -hmm. to 
heal the many scars of the past and when you and 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 one of the benchmarks for that was to get America to begin to talk about race and i think that one that one of the things that we are so enamored by all these black people on our tv machines right now is because uh, america is actually whether they're listening or not whether they're processing and synthesizing or not we are actually talking about race in america so but that doesn't um preclude the notion that it's not changing anything. I think all of us out there, everybody in our listening audience understands we can talk until we're bone in the face. They're still going to do it. They're still looking to do a 10% cut across the board for food stamps. Exactly. Exactly. And I think but see this is this is the bourgeois pretense of the of the academy. Right? I mean, I think I think most black people clearly understand that regardless of what you say and, and in fact this is this is the condition of being oppressed. That regardless of what you say, regardless of what you do, your condition remains the same or in line with the interests of your oppressor. And this is where I, you can really see the class dynamic, that the poor, the marginalized, the black, they understand that dynamic. But the black academic, well, we just can't have that. We have to be recognized. We have to get our blogs on Salon. We have to have white people on Huffington Post posters and get likes. We have to talk in a language of privilege. We have to we have to explain why everybody's view of the world is wrong but ours, our liberal, our multiculturalist, our pragmatist, our black feminist view. You see, those types of ideas, that idea that your recognition, that you write something and people attend to it or like you on Facebook or other social media, is set with privilege. It is set with the economic interest that people who pay attention to you somehow validate you. And that is a fundamentally foreign and oppositional notion to actually experiencing anti-black privilege. Because the person, or anti-black oppression, because the oppressed black person knows that no matter what you do, you're still invisible to a certain extent. You're seen. You can be killed. But you're invisible. You're not heard because people don't pay attention to your interest and to your will of existence. Right, but the black academic thinks that if we write certain things that our our agendas and our thoughts are heard and that it somehow makes a difference in the world. Again, the reason why I really see the downfall of racial idealism. The issue here is how what we write fundamentally affects the way our people think about the world. That's the task, right? And it's not some imaginary task. It's a very real, tangible task. Are we educating black people to go out into the world and see their existence and their communities in ways that are going to functionally affect how they approach the world in the future? In other words, when they get a degree, if they're going to be a lawyer, what type of law do they take up? Right? How do they practice the law? Do they believe the world is fair? Do they believe that they're equal simply despite their skin color? Right? These are the things that we have to actually change. That's the potential of black scholarship, right? That's why people like Du Bois wrote. That's why Ida B. Wells wrote. It wasn't because they thought they were going to change white people. I mean, Ida's clear about that. I could write about anti lynching all day. That's not going to change white people. But what I can change is how black communities organize or how black communities like the community in um, you know, Montgomery, Tennessee took up all arms to kill all the white lynchers. That's what she believes she could affect. That's why T. Thomas Fortune funded her. But today, we don't believe in supporting black outlets of uh, media. We don't support black news outlets. We don't support, support black intellectual circles because we no longer believe that the task of black scholarship is to revolutionize black people or the oppressed. We think it's to gain favor with our oppressor. We think that the white person that says, yay, great book, or the getting published by the white press is the pinnacle of academic success, right? And that's the problem. When you take, when you put all your eggs in the same basket, when you let your oppressor define the ways that your uh, scholarship has currency and who it reaches and why it reaches those people. In other words, you know, when people tell you to play nice and don't disrupt things until you get tenure or don't disrupt things until you get that first book or you need friends to do X, those things are censoring you. They confine you. They tell you that your thought can't say what you want it to say until it's approved by an already oppressive racial situation in university. Now, I don't buy that. I think that the the task of black scholarship has to be much more revolutionary. I don't mean revolutionary in a clicheish way, like saying radical things. I mean revolutionary in the ground level. How is it going to actually change how each black person or the black people that encounter that scholarship 
think about how they're going to change the world, how they're going to affect it, and how they're going to interpret the world. And that's what's really important. We're not arguing about interpretation anymore. We're arguing, arguing about morality. We're arguing about who has the best morality. I'm a black feminist. I'm black queer. All oh, these identity politics trump those identity politics. My morality is best. That's not, that shouldn't be the battle. The battle should be who is interpreting the world so that these politics shouldn't matter. Who's interpreting the world so that Puritan notions of homophobia and empire and sexual imperialism and savagery and barbarism and chauvinism don't affect black people to the extent that it does so it doesn't tear up families, incarcerate people, and get black women sterilized? See, those are the interpretive questions that we should ask, but we don't think ourselves outside of the box. We think with the tools that white people have given us, and we are to fighting each other because we're trying to play the morality politic game about who's the most cherished and who's loved by the oppressor the most. It's a dead end street, and I think that we've been in this cycle for the last 20 years at least. Well, one of the things that um, uh, comes up for me as, as as I hear you talking about this racial idealism is that the the other side of the coin, racial realism, is not just the answer it's not a standalone answer that no, you know that a, a state of power for black people would would not deploy um would 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 somehow stand up to the the the, the, the armies of sneering brutalizing murdering police police in in our neighborhoods would stand mm-hmm. up to not not only change um the way in which our children are educated and the system in which they are educated, but would take control of the educational process for 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 our children. Mm-hmm. You know, we have been told, and I want to talk about this in the in the context of racial realism. We've been told a number of things that one. Um, if if we um people say I like to play the people say game <laughs> people say the basic reason for the problems of black people have been the breakdown of the black family. People say that uh you can't talk of fundamental change in our community while the people are all caught up in killing each other. People say that our problem is that we have to get right with God. <laughs> People say right. that we need to get educated, and that's the problem. Mm-hmm. In, in the landscape of racial re- realism, I am wondering if we have forgotten or we have given up um, the fundamental black liberation struggle uh, and accommodated ourselves to comfort by way of uh, adopting the same, mm-hmm. the, the the very systems that oppress us. What say you, Dr. No, Curry? No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think I think you don't have to really look any further to the the prophetic symbolism that you get out of Obama for that answer. Right? I mean, we we like to pathologize ourselves because we if we we think we're on the right side of the argument, right? I mean it's Don Lemon. You know, there we understand that no matter how much you blame black people for their own condition, their condition has been the same practically since slavery in terms of their political and economic, you know, subservience to white people. So you're dealing with a situation of absolute deprivation, dehumanization from slavery to Jim Crow to segregation, et cetera. And black people have had the same types of conditions, same types of problems. But now that you've somehow eliminated the segregation barrier, you now say, well, now black people magically become responsible to the same things that's played them since they arrived in the, you know, in, into modernity in the new world. I find those things ridiculous. But at the same time, these conversations have play. They have currency because the people who interpret black people are always white people. And it's just black people who agree with white people, not black people who are trying to fundamentally interpret their own reality. And that's what I mean when I say that we get into these kind of morality games. So even when you have black people, and I actually I did a segment on our Ready News Review about this, on my Talking Tough with Tommy segment. And I said, that, look, 
even when you have black people who disagree with Don Lemon, what are they doing? They're publishing pieces in Ebony. They're publishing pieces in Salon. They're publishing pieces on all these mainstream kind of pop culture venues. And why are they doing that? Because they want recognition for taking up a different type of morality, a progressive liberal black morality, outside or next to Don Lemon. It's not fundamentally about why Don Lemon is entrenching white supremacy. It's not fundamentally about why Don Lemon has a stake in entrenching white supremacy. It's about Don Lemon agrees with Bill O'Reilly. That's conservative, and here's the liberal view of it. But if we look deeper, if we look to why, why do you have black intellectuals or black pundits agreeing with white people? What does that say about the status of black journalism? What does it say about the status of black news? What does it say about how black intellectuals should or should not have currency in these types of debates? Those questions are asked because everybody's fighting for the same thing recognition by white people be it liberal whites or conservative whites you know that's the battle you know and i think that when you have black people that pathologize themselves it not only comes i mean it's just wrong right because most you can you can say that there's an issue in the black family but if you're not talking about uneducation under education under underemployment unemployment the prison industrial complex Racism, the effects that racism have on the psychology of people. Where right? there's all these aspects, if you're not talking about health, life expectancy, etc. Then you're missing the picture. You can't talk about and pathologize a community as if it's a utopian community where people are just making choices without understanding. Well, what's the life expectancy of a black man? What's the life expectancy of a black boy who's going to become a man? What's his exposure to violence? What's his exposure to sexual assault and abuse? Does he fear women? Does he have a sickness or a, a pathology towards any kind of relationships with? With women, right? There, there's all kind of conversations about why black families fail, or even the, the conservatism of the black community not accepting uh, gay black families, right? There's all kind of reasons that families fail within the black community, both ideological, religious, economic, political, etc. But those don't get play. Those don't get any kind of sentiment, right? They don't get any attention by academics or otherwise because, again, we're playing the political game. But then when we talk about the external factors, then white people become defensive. And then that's where you get the black bourgeois to say, well, we can't all blame white people. Let's put some of that on ourselves too. It's dishonest conversations. The people who say that are imitating conversations. They're not actually understanding the kind of sociological history of black people and the ills that affect the black community. And it's sickening because the way that black academics, I say this all the time, the ways that black academics profit off of this is that they pick certain sides. They use the pathologies of the black community, bad households, poverty, etc., to justify why they should accelerate and rise in the academy. So they'll say black people suffer racism, but they've separated themselves into another class. But to get recognition for white people, to get economic benefits like tenure or like respect or to claim themselves as a race scholar, they give personal testimony about how they too rose from these classes. Even though they don't exist or share any of the same interests anymore, as long as they say that they have some tangential connection to them, they get to play off the pathology. I came from a broken family. It's, the, the stories I hear at conferences are sick. They're fundamentally anti-intellectual because there's not an examination about these issues in the community about what causes black people to suffer or black families to be torn apart or the high rates of domestic abuse in our in our communities via uh, drug abuse, alcoholism, and, you know, constant incarceration or police brutality. None of those, none of those are talked about, just their personal stories so that white people sympathize with them and want to do something for them. And those are the types of things that are problematic because what it shows to the black masses is that because black intellectuals are fundamentally detached from the condition that black people suffer, there's no one trying to, as Educate or at least talk to black the black public about why these issues still persist, and then what black people as a whole, intellectuals and the masses together, could do to remedy that. Most black intellectuals can't stand the black community, and that the problem, and that's the problem that we we allow certain dogmas and ideologies to circulate that we know better than. But because we're interested in our pocketbooks and our checkbooks and who we think are the important people in our fields, we disregard them. And it's a sad situation. I've seen it happen for over the last decade, being you know, in and out of the academy. We we speak as if we're racial radicals. We speak like we're the Martin Luther King and, you know, Malcolm X's of our generations, but in reality, you know, we're Thomas Sowell, we're we're Colin Powell, you know, we're people who talk about our rise as if we represent these groups of people when we fundamentally detest them because we don't want to be associated with the pathologies that define those black people when we're trying to be a new type of representative black person. It's a sickness. Well, one of the things that in, in, in your description and your your detailed explanation 
uh, about how this happens in the academy is that we know it happens everywhere. It happens in government. It happens Absolutely. in the private sector. Mm-hmm. It, it, it even happens in our activist community. Yes, ma'am. It is problematic. It is it it, it is a a one hundred percent contributor to why we are sitting in the same place we were twenty years ago as a people. Dr. Curry, thank you so very much for for being with us. Uh, we're going to have to take a break, but when we come back, I, I want to talk about racial realism mm-hmm. and how we read both the media, the, 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 the TV machine, programs like this program, programs that are not like this program but say they are, and um, a, a reading of how that fits into a, a dismantling of this sen- of racial sentimentality. I mean, I have just been appalled, and, and as you know, I attended the... Um, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, mm-hmm. and um, um, I, 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 I stood there saying, please stop talking, please stop talking, right. because I, <laughs> I, I think that we have idealized to the extent, not only where we are today, but our history. We have allowed the distortions and the contusions uh, to mar our ability to relay uh, our our capacity for witnessing, and it is problematic. It is lending itself to our to our invisibility. You're listening to Our Common Ground. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'm Janice Graham, and our number is 347-838-9852, and we'll be taking your calls with Dr. Tommy J. Curry, who is a professor of philosophy at Texas A&M University. We're talking social justice, black liberation, and the idealism and real uh, the the lack of idealism um in have with us and I am so pleased because this young brother is blowing my mind. <laughs> I don't think we've we've heard such succinct examination of uh critical race theory and he calls it cultural logics. Uh he's published many pieces on popular uh, culture, black feminism and Africana womanism and black intellectual history, and he's working on the republication of William H. Ferris's The African Abroad and two other manuscripts uh, entitled Nationalist Dawn and On Two Thoughts, Schools of Thoughts. And he is heavily... Uh, influenced by my mentor and a dear friend who walks with me constantly, Dr. Derek Bell. Um, Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. uh, Tommy Curry, for being with us tonight. Let me ask you to talk about uh, the era of Obama and what that has meant in terms of where we see ourselves and our uh, our our need to rise out of this sentimentality and begin to act. Wow, Barack Obama. I don't know what I can say about Barack Obama. Uh, It hasn't already been said. Well, it's his (laughs) era. I think that there has, has been an environment that has been created Right. Um, it, by his election and yeah, by his it, presidency, absolutely. That uh, has, was, on one hand, lulled us; on the other hand, caused a great deal of confusion. And I think that we have to start thinking about where we're going to be and where we are. Right. Uh, no, one I think, I, you're is no right. longer the president. Right. Right. And. I think I think there's kind of a twofold danger in Obama. 
You know, it, it's funny you ask me. I, I was just reading a piece by uh, Dylan Rodriguez, the bro, the black presidential non-slave. Uh, it was sent to me by a, a young brother, uh, Chris Randall, um, up at Rutgers. You know, very sharp brother that's very race conscious. And one of the things I was telling him, you know, when we were discussing this piece was that, you know, what Rodriguez is suggesting is that Barack Obama has kind of uh, amplified, he's embodied this mythology about the United States racial progressivism, that he's not only become a symbol to black people, but he's become proof, uh, kind of the reincarnation of Jesus Christ himself, right, that redeems all the racial sins of America. And when you have that kind of figure configured within a white supremacist society. So we know that before Obama, everybody was white. We know that during the election of Obama, Hillary Clinton was saying, America's not ready for a, a black president. You should vote white. And you've had this huge backlash by white America saying that we shouldn't have a black president. Right? So, so white supremacy about who represents a white republic like America is all around them. And by Obama being this black president, we've only thought about it in symbolic terms, in the sense that, oh, well, he's black and white America hates him, so we have to support Obama. But in reality, we don't we don't get this other side that Barack Obama is the it's the pink slip. He's the excuse that America uses and the agenda and military industrial complex uses to carry out unfathomable counts of violence and unfathomable racial and racist programs against black people. And no one holds him accountable because we want to tout Obama. And I think that one of the ways that this really affects the black community, and it's, I'm going back to black academics and kind of the, the racial logic of how black people think about their own situation, is we only see skin color. And this is our fault, right? There's a lot of things that I blame white supremacy for, but this part is our fault. We have allowed Barack Obama because of his skin color and because of our individual pride of seeing a black person rise through the ranks in a racist society to overlook how that black person acts towards black people in that white society. He has become – he is the most powerful person in the world in the sense of the militaries and the economic power he wields as the president. But then when black people begin to question him, we feel as if we're doing damage to ourselves because we're asking, what is he doing for the black community? Why is it that the state violence that black people have saw themselves trying to fight against throughout the civil rights movement to now has been just magnified to unbelievable proportions under his presidency. And the thing that we haven't realized is if you have a black person that is the symbol for white power, then that black person has to take up by the essence of the position that they occupy an anti-black stand. So his policies about war, his policies and stance on Syria, his policies on intervention, his policies on the Middle East, his derelict, his ignoring of the black condition now, his favoring of white women over the black poor, these things speak to the conceptualization of how Obama himself rationalizes what America should look like. We saw this in 2008 with his presidential speech and him disowning um, Brother Jeremiah Wright. The issue for Obama is that you have to remove the sin that black people keep holding America accountable for. He wants to usher in a post-racial ethic, and doing that, he says, even where we see racial incidences, we have to remember that America in itself has the fabric to move beyond racism. But the problem with that account is that black people are still dying and suffering under what his philosophy and symbolism supposedly represents for America. And we've been fooled by that. And, I, and even speaking, and we talk about academics, then you're just talking about people who are for or against Obama. And most of most black ad, academics are for him because they identify with what Obama represents in terms of the black bourgeoisie. So you don't get black intellectuals for the mainstay. So you're not going to get the Melissa Harris Perrys or the Michael Eric Dysons or any of these other people really coming out and criticizing Obama. And anytime anyone does – they're automatically put into the camp of being leftist, Marxist, etc. And as we know, those types of intellectuals, those black radicals, don't really get a lot of play. And then even when you have someone like Cornell West and Tavis Smiley trying to double team Obama, not even on race, and this is and this is the problem I have with their criticism of him, is that they won't criticize him on his racial politics as much as his economic policies about poor people. But again, I've said this tons of times before. It's hard to believe that Cornell West and Tavis Smiley's criticism are genuine because they're just the outed cast or the outed class of the Melissa Harris Perry's and Michael Eric Dyson. 
Tysons who just disagree with Obama. Like, they functionally benefited from touting his policies and touting that type of progressive ideology for the longest, and now where they disagree with him and they're trying to get spotlight for that, they're being crushed by these other black bourgeois who are like, no, we're pro-Obama. The whole time, the black masters are looking like, well, we support the symbolism, but he's not doing anything for us, and nobody is standing up for them. Nobody's standing up and saying the issue here is racial complacency, that you can have a black face in a neocolonial order that is fundamentally anti-black. And what's even worse about this, and I think this is the point that Dylan Rodriguez makes very well, it participates in a type of logics that organize the world in such a way that you have endless and inevitable anti-black violence and creations come about, i.e. the use of drones to police black bodies in black neighborhoods. It's a technological advancement, a new possibility that's birthed because of Obama's militarism that is fundamentally used used against black people because he's still in line with the white supremacist agendas of America. In order for him to gain legitimacy and maintain that legitimacy, he finds no problem throwing the black masses and the black public and the black poor under the bus so that he still maintains political power. It's a very dangerous dynamic. And what black intellectuals, what black scholars should be doing is pointing to that kind of that kind of pathology. How it is that you have Obama rising in the ranks as a black bourgeois who actually has a connection to Derrick Bell. This is the irony of the whole thing. Who actually has a connection to these kind of ideas yeah. that look, law is manipulated, economics is manipulated, right? He's the one who introduced Bell back in the day. Open your hearts and minds to the teachers of Bell. This was the Breitbart issue. But at the same time he did that, Derek was extremely, extremely critical of Obama talking about why he why he embraces the prophetic symbolism that he represents. And I think that when you have someone like that with a Messiah complex, in many and I mean that in a very literal term, when you have someone that believes that they are the post racial icon of America, a new epic of American history, he knows what he represents, then you're inevitably going to deal with these types of pressures. You're going to deal with the types of violence and contradictions between a black body in charge of the White House and black bodies dying on the streets, right? And when you don't have clarification, we don't have ideas, and when you don't have a language to talk about that, that means you're inevitably going to be a victim. People talking about why we should love Obama or why we should care about what Obama's doing or his sympathy and his speech at Morehouse without addressing the death of black men, the same people that he's talking to at Morehouse, telling them to go back to families and not pursue the uplift their communities, only take these, these, these very local conservative ideas while he's allowing and creating programs for economic enlistment for white women, it's an insult. And it suggests to us that he values the lives and economic progress of white people over the black communities and black voices that put him in office in the first place. It's a disrespectful system, first and foremost, but it's also one that tells you a lot about the political and governmental structure of America. And that's something that we don't talk about because, like I said, when you're talking about racial idealism, you're talking about discourse, discourses of power, discourses of pessimism, discourses about how people think about racial symbols. You're not talking about concrete institutions, like actual police becoming militarized, like increases in poverty, like what increases of poverty do to black men that are policed by the state that are going to be incarcerated for, right? These are the concrete realities that the racial realist looks to, and it's one of the reasons that I think that most of the race crits that are still on the racial realist bandwagon, I, I, I certainly know this uh, factually of Derek Bell before he passed the way we're extremely critical and in many ways uh, invested in advocating or exposing the symbolism that Obama himself uh, embodied. Well, one of the things um, that occurred in the academy as well with Derrick Bell is that uh, based upon his protest of appointments of black tenured women at Harvard Law School, right. <laughs> Excuse me, he was labeled. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize. Uh, he was labeled as weird. Right. In the context of what, uh, in the context of how he operated based upon the expectation of how he should be, feel privileged and feel honored and grateful of his position at Harvard Law School, right. which I found so appalling and so demonic that it, I was beyond myself. Let's talk about how the media and how the academics have dealt with the issue of uh, Trayvon Martin recent, um, recently um, 
um, Farrell. Um, By Jonathan Farrell. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Farrell. And for those of you who do not know, Jonathan Farrell is the young black man who sought help after a car accident in North Carolina, and he was killed by by uh, local police because he was seen as an intruder in a white community. What are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Curry, about those events and how the Academy has dealt with them or the people of the Academy um, and <clears throat> this idea of how black men are being dealt with out of the black intellectual community. Well, I mean, I think, I think we, we already know how the media is going to portray black men regardless, right? I mean, when black men or even black children, black boys die, uh, there's always an ambiguity that it's possibly and most likely justified, right? And this is, and this is, we we all know this, right? This is this is what you know Huey was saying. This is what Sada said, right? This is the, the Panthers understood this well, that you can't depend on the newspapers and the journalism of your oppressor to paint you in a good light. That is always going to be propaganda used to justify whatever the police state is doing, you know. And this is this is one of the insights in black in black nationalist thought that I don't ever think is really really given. Why like we we masculinize black the black power movement. Because it doesn't fit with these other artificial and bourgeois notions of femininity and capitalist uh, progress and social capital that come about in the 1970s. But when you look at what they're saying, they're trying to give you other avenues of educating and reaching out to the black community. I don't think any other movement in history, uh, unless you're talking about the radical black journalist movement in the late 1800s, have really done Right, so I think that you know they recognize that. I think that's first and foremost that when the media is going to handle death of black people in general and the deaths of black men specifically, it's always going to be through the eyes and interests of how the state wants to rationalize itself. We saw this in Trayvon Martin. We're seeing it in Farrell. That's what's going to happen now. In terms of the academy, I mean, there's just there's just so much ridiculousness in terms of how we explain black men's position that it, it becomes. I mean, that becomes a book rather you know rather than an interview. I mean, we simply the academy cannot understand much less describe and truly dig into or analyze the existence of black men and boys in this country. Uh, the death of Trayvon Martin became a symbol. And, I, and my wife and I actually wrote an article about this, uh, you know, Another Black Boy is Dead, where we really spoke to the fact that, look, as soon as you get the ver- verdict on Trayvon Martin, immediately identity politics kicks in. And you have this explosion of black feminist criticism saying that, you know, nobody's paid attention to black women's lives in this way, that black women have largely been ignored. And one of the things that my wife and I pointed out in our article was that, look, black people have paid attention to this. Reading News Review paid paid attention to it. Black Agenda Report paid attention to it, right? As you were telling me, you know, even with your work with Melissa Alexander, right, these things have been covered. But the issue is that black academics don't value and don't care about what black people are saying. They care about intervening themselves into very particular academic conversations for recognition with white people. So even though black communities are mourning and organizing around the death of sisters, you know, I, I always talk about that young sister, Ayanna Stanley, even though black communities and it's some, you know, grassroots intellectuals are organizing around these children's deaths and trying to protest and doing end of those movements become invisible because they don't play into the politics and currency of what happens when black people die. Because when black people die, we use that. We take those deaths and we hand them off to the academies and to journals and to uh, articles and say, see, look, we have a point. Put me in. Let me write. Let me get into your mainstream white liberal venue so that I can tell everyone why you're the greatest for letting me in and everybody else is wrong. But they do that by erasing what black that people are actually saying and suffering because uh, uh, of the deaths in their communities. Now, I think that when you talk about black men, you have you have a problem. You know, uh, Greg Thomas does great work on this. He he talks about when we understand the histories of gender, we largely understand them in terms of the feminine, in terms of women, and that's not just in the sense of a political battle between black men and black feminists, but it's also in terms of our historical imagination. 
when we think about white women specifically, we don't think about white women as being the perpetrators of violence. So even though we saw white women jurors, white female jurors acquit George Zimmerman, in our imaginations we think, well, they're racist, but we don't see white women as being historical agents of racism in this country. And this is despite the fact that white women had Klan organizations like Kathleen Blee talks about. This is despite the fact that uh, white women were raping black men during slavery like Thomas Foster was talking about. This is despite the fact that even though Eldridge Cleaver gives us a very rich analysis of how white women are the ogre are used as a symbol for black men to hate black women and in act in, in in all reality strive towards them only to be incarcerated and killed in the hands of white men. We ignore that. We pretend that womanhood and white womanhood specifically is innocent. So when black men run up against these issues like Jonathan Farrell looking at a white woman seeking help and her only seeing a black man that should be killed, only seeing a nigger, only seeing that and calling the police, literally demanding them to intervene and cause the death of this brother, we don't have a language to explain or identify that white woman as being fundamentally guilty and a historical agent of the killing of black men. So then when that gets translated into the academy, since we don't have a language for it, all we have are languages of sympathy. All we have are languages of reaction. All we have are languages of disbelief. How could this happen? We don't have systematic analysis because black men are constantly pictured as only being oppressors and problematic. They're only understood in terms of their problems, and this is so important. We don't analyze black men as being creators of theory or having experiences or even histories that contextualize their own existence. We only look at them as statistics. We look at them as exceptions to the rule, that we know that this is how justice should work, but they never get it. And then when they do get to positions to speak about themselves, we demonize them. So if you have a black man that makes it into the academy, and I'm not saying there's all black men, but you do have some black scholars that try to talk about black men, they're accused of being too masculine. They're accused of being not sensitive to, to feminism. They're accused of all these other things, despite the fact that there is no dominant intellectual traditions that can talk about black men manhood, despite the black men are not only not making it to the university, they're not making it through high school, and they're being put in jail, and they're being killed. So even though you have an undercast, as Michelle Alexander talks about, of black men in this country, they're subject to incarceration and death. There is a constant force in the academy to erase and silence that reality, because the reality of black men in this country is that if you accept their existence, then it fractures and ruptures all the progressive liberal recognition identity politics crap that gets so much play. It, it exceeds discourse. You can't talk about it because you don't have a language to describe it. And then when you do talk about it, there's no moral system, no ethical system that can even account for what happens to them. So people just ignore it. We go about business on the on the daily. We go about business as usual, and we just say, well, Trayvon Martin was killed. Let's talk about it. Let's write a book about it. Here's about here's how I feel. But we don't use that death of Trayvon Martin. We don't use the death of Jonathan Farrell, of Darius Simmons, of Jordan Davis, of Chris Dorner to say anything about the actual organization and genocidal tendencies that befall black men in this country. And see, and this is what I like about these old school scholars like Sylvia Winter. Like she wrote an essay back in 1992, No Humans Evolved, and what she explained was that when the LAPD encountered poor working poor working class jobs, Jobless black men, what she found was that they used a term, no humans evolved to describe them. And that was only it was not only a term of dehumanization, but it was a term that decided and kind of already exposed the relationship that the state would have to these black citizens. It was a genocidal inclination. Now she recognized that not because of identity politics, but because what was actually going on. But today when we recognize that, we frame it as the new Jim Crow and Michelle Alexander, which is a good book, but it's it's not hardly as radical. It's not hardly as as rupturing as the concept that there is a functional teleology, an actual purpose in psychology in America that views some people as fundamentally savage. And and the reason they view those people as savage is not because of any behavior, but because of a fundamental nature in them. A nature that can't be accounted for in disciplines. A nature that can't be accounted for in how we think about citizens. A nature that is fundamentally unfree, even though it, li it is claimed to exist in a free democratic society. Now, when you can reconcile those types of contradictions, then you're getting somewhere. But we can't even begin to understand why it's a contradiction. Because we naturalize black men as being problems in society. They're criminals. Oh, they're not a criminal, so they're the exception. We naturalize the types of problems that exist, and we pretend that that's just what happens. So even like Ida B. Wells back in the day, 
black men get lynched, she at one point believed that, well, they should because they're rapists. It wasn't until Thomas Moss died that she was like, well, there's something else going on here. And we haven't got to that aha moment yet. We haven't understood that there's an economic relationship, a political relationship, and a fundamental racist and genocidal relationship to how black men are treated. So academics stay silent so they can stay rewarded and maintain the coherence of their discipline. So philosophy and ethics or political science and politics or economics and capitalism can all stay married in parallel to how they understand the world and where they think that it should inevitably go. Black men fracture that. They disrupt and contradict everything we know about the world, and academics don't like the messy knowledge. Messy knowledge. <laughs> I love that term. Listen, Dr. Curry, let me ask you about the role of black womanism Mm -hmm. in the empowerment of our people. I I see Ida B. Wells. Mm -hmm. uh, And one of the things that was, was clear about her life is that she walked, she talked the talk and walked the walk. Absolutely. Absolutely. I so, think So what is the role of black womanism in in empowering our people? Well I think there's I think there's two things. I mean, uh it's funny I was talking to my wife about this the other day. I mean I think in many ways Womanism, you know, because Clonor's term of Africana womanism versus, you know, Alice Walker's term versus, you know, Lady Phillips, you know. I think I think when we use the term womanism, uh, we're really kind of talking about an organic uh, growing or understanding of black women from the perspective of black women. Um, I think that the concern that Sylvia Winter raised was that, look, well, I know this is her concern, right? She was worried about the bourgeoisation of feminism. And what she meant by that was, how is it that black women are, who are now calling themselves black feminists so closely aligned to white women who have always had a historical role in oppressing black people as a whole? And then when those conversations become trapped within the economic uh, sector, who's the breadwinner, who's recognized as being equal X, Y, and Z, then the question of how black, actual black women, the black poor, the black mother, the black girl, the black teacher, right, the working class black person falls to the side because it's only existing in terms of elite, terms of being the breadwinner and really being equal to the white man. I mean, this was a similar concern that we get in unisexualization by, you know, Nathan and Julia Hare. So I think that when you're talking about womanism, you're talking about a very cultural aspect of how that black woman part, that poor part, that working class part, that mother part is fundamentally involved with how they think about their own political existence. See, black women have historic they didn't need feminism to talk about their own issues. I mean when you look at a organic intellectual like Claudia Jones, she's given a very rich political economic analysis of why black women are poor. And she admits back in the nineteen forties that black women are doubly oppressed in terms of you know, race and gender. But the analysis is is striking because it's not simply because they're black and they're women. They're oppressed because you live in an economic situation that makes sure that black men can never provide for you the way that white men can. So you have to enter the workforce. And when you enter the workforce, you're going to be exploited based on your race and gender. And by that exploitation, that alienation from what you produce working in the factories in allegedly a male job, that produces economic exploitation. See, she gave us a very structural analysis Right of what happens that we keep today. Today we call that intersectionality, but she was doing that stuff back in the 1940s from a Marxist perspective. You get the same thing with Ida B. Wells. She looks at lynching and says, "Well, look, there's an economic cause for why black men are being accused for rape." See, womanism deals with the actual sociological and historical consciousness of black people, and I don't think it's the end-all, be-all paradigm for how we understand sexuality or gender either. This is when I, when I was speaking earlier about some of the black radical critiques of the Black Panther movement, right? I mean, I think this is where the work of Elaine Brown comes in, the, you know, uh, her concept of uh, condification. You know, Carol Boyce Davis really wrote about this. You have, in the black feminist movement, you don't have an ethical boundary for what type of black woman should be created by the movement. So Elaine Brown, for instance, says, look, Condoleezza Rice becomes the epitome of the black feminist movement because you can disagree with her politics, but she's achieved governmental, social, economic, and political power despite the fact that that power is used in the service of empire. 
And there's no ethical balance of that. Whereas in womanism are these anti-colonial discourses that you get out of, you know, the works of Fanon or that you get out of Sylvia Winter says, no, you can't be in the service of empire if you want liberation. And see, I think that's where it comes, the difference fundamentally comes in. The womanist slash black radical intellectual tradition holds the intent and purpose behind the seeking of power just as accountable as the end of power. So if you're going through the capitalist ranks and you're competing with black men, you're competing with white women, you're competing with white men purely to represent the same level that they have, then you're not engaging in a cultural or social historical criticism of what's wrong with empire. You're simply manipulating the politics of recognition and the liberal discourse of integration or equality to rise up those ranks. I think when you look at Sylvia Winter, when you look at Elaine Brown, when you look at Asada Shakur, when you look at the young Angela Davis, and I want to preface that with the adjective young Angela Davis, you're I getting hear a criticism you. of exactly right. You're getting a criticism <laughs> of economic domination, empire, and fascism. Those words aren't mentioned anymore. And I find it ironic that these words are never mentioned because you'll have black feminists criticizing black men for their radical politics, but then you'll have people like Martin Luther King say that you can have no people in the world rise without understanding the relationship between economic exploitation and militarism. And he's fighting for all the colored people in the world, all the people of color the world over, Latin America, Africa, etc. So American black feminism pretends that even though black men are fun are fundamentally committed to ending the economic exploitation of people everywhere, especially black women, right, in Africa, especially the darker races in Latin America, etc., that somehow it does, because it doesn't fit a bourgeois notion of their economic progress in America, that they somehow misunderstand the concept of gender, right? And this is what Oyuwami points to, that the idea of womanism grows from the concern about how black people, men and women, interrelate in their communities. This is Tony Cobb Bombara. This is the misunderstanding of how yeah. people keep using her as a feminist, right? But if they understand that her essay on the issue of roles, they understand that she's questioning how black people, black radicals, black civil rights generation people are reinventing the will simply talking about radical politics, but imitating and culturally reproducing conservative gender ideology. But people, and, but people don't act like they can't understand nuance. So I think womanism is one of the many interventions that – Black people have organically raised up, right? I mean, I think my mom's a woman. It's not in the sense that she identifies with the label, but she understood the, you know, the danger of raising black sons, right? So you understand a, a woman who is intelligent, has gone to college, who's working, who raises sons, who's a mother, and sees no contradiction in all of that, right? Where you have the black feminists would demonize the the subservience allegedly within the family, or not emphasizing the gender dynamic. I think that when you really talk about Gender or sexuality in the black community You have to do it from a perspective Where you understand that the sexualities That we live out Or the sexualities that we seek to embody Are ultimately formulated on Occidental notions of culture and ideology Our task, as I was saying before Needs to be to revolutionize that To rethink why we're committed To certain investments in gender To think why we're recommitted To certain concepts of masculinity or femininity And why we can't handle certain contradictions Like the death of black men Being an issue of gender and sexuality I mean I mean, this is the danger of having bourgeois academics run the academy and constantly reproduce text after text on gender or vestibular space or the concept of the woman in psychoanalytic terms. They can't understand very basic facts that you cannot isolate anti-black violence to any specific gender because sexual exploitation is a fundamental characteristic of black genocide. During slavery, they raped men and women. Why? Because it was an issue of power. It was about the exploitation of black bodies, period, that made sure that those black bodies did not see themselves or conceptualize themselves as human bodies. If you understand that basic historical fact and the ideology underlying it, undergirding it, then you have to accept that the concept of gender that you have in your head could not be applied to those black bodies. So when you impose it on them, you do violence to them because it creates a world where you fundamentally misunderstand the histories that they suffered through. And when we employ it today, we do it simply to imitate and take advantage of the political power that's held in being a feminist or held in being a woman in our way to try to get equality, which only means that we imitate and try to attain the types of wealth and corrupt uh, baggage that Europeans have laid out as being the pinnacles of success. It's an embarrassing cyclical cyclical ideology, and I think I think Babar was right that if we're going to talk about how we free black people, it, it, it entails us making sure that black women, and I mean black women, not black feminists, black women 
are at the hell of defining what their issues are and how the black community should respond to them. And black men, by the same token, are expressing their vulnerabilities that they have not only to women, but white women in this world as well. If we can't have that conversation, we're going to keep having Jonathan Farrell's and Trayvon Martin's, and we're going to keep saying that we have allies in white women because they're women without understanding that they are fundamentally bent, that they have been historically committed to anti-black racism and death, and we pretend that they're not part of that conversation. So I think womanism gives us a different racial consciousness, but I think womanism inevitably has to give way to these more anti-colonial and radical and revolutionary notions of sexuality and sexual mm-hmm. policy. And what I hear you saying is that the – the the to fight the oppression of African American people and uh black people in this country, the system has in the end responded by re entrenching and reinforcing within our own community, making it almost impossible to modify the forms of oppression that that we, we we face. And Absolutely. if we are determined uh, to participate, you know, uh, one of our guests, one of my favorite people is Dr. Vernelia Randall, uh, who retired last year from Ohio State University Law School uh, mm-hmm. Dayton, at Dayton. And, and one of the things that she reiterates over and over is that you cannot expect to change a justice system by embracing it. You have oh, to re- first reject it as the first strike of challenge. And right. that is one of the things that we seem not to be getting our heads around, our our arms around, and embracing in our community. I mean, anyone who understands the history of the feminist movement in this country recognizes, understands, knows that it is based upon oppression of other people other than white women. Oh, right, right. I mean, you know, I think I think that the you see, and this is one of the things that always disappoint me is that, you know, I would always I would expect, you know, black women who identify with the feminist movement, call themselves black feminists, to be on the on the forefront of this research about white women. I would expect that. Like, if you're committed to the understanding of gender and sexuality, I would expect black women to be writing pamphlet after pamphlet, uh, article after article, book after book about the sexual violence that white women have played in the black community, be it on black boys, black girls, black men, black women. But that's not what we have. What we have are criticisms of the failure of solidarity. In reality, black feminism has spent most of its energies trying to integrate the feminist movement, trying to seek uh, a voice at a table. I mean, this is Bell Hooks' work, right? And, I mean, you see Bell Hooks really get into the phallocentric analysis of black men off of the back of Michelle Wallace's work, but none of that is about the fundamental reformulation of black politics. It's about the recognition and the, as I call it, the epistemic convergence, the coalescing with already established white feminist theories at that time that, from the second wave and imposing that on the black community. And I think that when you have that type of dynamic, and that dynamic is rewarded. And this is see, this is so important. Remember, black sisters like, you know, Elaine Brown, the young Angela Davis, you know, Asada Shakur, these these people were persecuted. These people uh-huh. were persecuted and, and, for talking about sexual struggle, politics. And their struggle was with sacrifice. Right. And if that means that we have to give up our notion of happiness is based upon a capitalist society, an empty justice system, then that's what we have to do, folks. Exactly. But then but then what did the black feminists do? They got nice cozy homes in the academy. You see, to me to me that says something. You see, when you when you kill a peaceful person like Martin Luther King and you coin tell pro I put government surveillance and, and, and assassinations on the Black Panther Party. If I'm looking at his, the history of movements, then I'm going to ask you, well, why is it that the black man who was a pacifist but economically organized and killed by the CIA, why did the government stamp out the Black Panthers and try to kill the sisters in, there in either exile or they were a political prison that got you know asylum? And then the other movement that comes in the back saying that all of those movements were wrong and disingenuous gets rewarded with a home in the academy. Absolutely. Which which George Jackson recognized was the seat, the hotbed, the foundation of the economic of the reproduction of the economic system in America, the the creation of the of the of the uh, new age workforce. 
See, that's what I mean when I say thinking through things. I mean, that to me, that seems like a legitimate question. How does the government kill everybody else, but you're but you're safe in the academy? And then today, when anyone challenges or brings back any of those types of movements and the sisters implicated in those movements, you suggest that either those sisters are mistaken because you have the real history, or you simply call all the black men who were still fighting for economic and sexual politics, radical politics, masculinist, as if that somehow disengages or dis, uh, discredits any or everything they say because you have a certain version of history that has more moral weight. You see, that's what I mean when I say that the academy and disciplines fundamentally construct, dominate, and control the way that we talk about. They police the morality of what we can say and how we talk about the things in the in the university. Right. right. And we've it's a, we've it's only a got a few situation. more minutes uh, yes, in this discussion. And one of the things, um, uh, Dr. Curry, I wanted to, to cover with you is this whole notion of one of the reasons I do this program, one of the reasons that this is serious, we don't do a lot of laughing around here, even though I try. I try to be uh, every now and then to perk up the, the our audience with a little um, mm-hmm. uh, being clever, but clever is not my thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about is how do regular working adult black people begin to benefit from scholars like you, uh, aside from reading. I mean, uh, your your writing is absolutely uh, so on point, so perfect. And, and we do this program because this kind of analysis, this kind of examination of uh, on the critical issues, this kind of critical progressive thinking, our people need to hear, but they're Absolutely. not hearing. They need your yeah, classes, I, but they can't get to them. And well, we have you know, all the technology. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, we've discussed this before. I mean, I think I think this is, you know, the question of opening up, uh, you know, the university. I mean, you know, even the classes I teach at A and M are absolutely open. I, I say anybody from the community, anyone could come into my class, and I think that we have to take that that uh, venture even further. You know, using utilizing social media, uh, perhaps as a way to bring the classes out, you know, to the public, to the you know, on the large scale. The other thing I think that needs to happen is that you know, black academics have to make themselves available to black people. Uh, you know, what I try to do in everything is. You know, I go to conferences, I speak to people, I reach out to students, and I actually reply to my emails. So when people email me or get in contact with me about my thoughts or if they disagree with it, I actually try to take the time to speak to them about what's going on or what I'm missing or what they don't understand or even the contributions that they have to the conversation. And I think that that doesn't happen a lot of times. I think that academics make themselves safe and off limits to everyone else because that way they don't have to be questioned. Right, because if I'm just the, if I'm the university professor and you're just the you know regular Jerome or you know Tyrone, then I could just write off any disagreement you have as not being educated. Mm-hmm. What I try to do is I actually try to engage people. So if people contact me or they hit me on Facebook or they listen to my show on Reading News Review or read my pieces on Racism Review, I try to create dialogues with those individuals, even despite disagreement, despite what they say. And I think that it's those criticisms and trying to make ourselves available to the public, and we can all do better jobs with. Them. I'm not suggesting that. I'm in any way perfect, but I'm saying that it's that type of engagement where we're trying to get the recognition of black people rather than white colleagues that's the basis of how we uh, actually get, uh, you know, some progress going, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how that's how we're going to have to – and you got to think about it. This is what black intellectuals were back in the day. I mean, people like Hubert Harrison, these people were on the, on the streets, on the soapboxes talking to people. Right, trying to form new pedagogies, trying to form new curricula, trying to organize black students on campus. That's not the way we do things anymore. We we stick to our own blogs, we stick to our own circles, and we expect those people to get his tenure, and that's it. That's our concern. Getting above, getting eighty, ninety thousand, and then making over a hundred thousand when we get full. That's what we're taught to do. I fundamentally disagree with that model, right? But that's what we're taught to do. So I think that we have to, you know, for people to have access to scholars, and I mean, especially people like me, I mean, I'm open to it, but we have to, you know, I'm saying this all the time, the black public has to start criticizing the black intellectuals, because we have a sophisticated black public, but black intellectuals don't want to be held accountable to them, because we just don't, one, we don't really read enough or really have a sensibility of what they're going through, and the other part is that we want to separate ourselves from their interests, where we become almost demigods that don't have to respond to the people that we think are fundamentally pathological judging our work. And I think both of those systems have to have to go. 
Well, we are indeed going to be inviting you back to our common ground and using you as a that. consultant uh, as, on on various issues uh, uh, about race and race in America, because I think that uh, the kind of self-determination foundation that you create for your students is sorely needed uh, among adults in our community who will not have access uh, to the kind of black scholarship that you have created and offer in your classrooms. Tommy J. Curry, thank you so very much, and I want to thank thank you, Rob Redding of the Rob Redding uh, News Review uh, for all the material that I have been able to pick up off of his website. For those of you who are in our chat room, we have provided a link of where you can reach uh, Dr. Curry and read his work and follow him on Facebook. Thank you so very much, and we still have to have that talk. I haven't forgotten. And listen, (laughs) I saw... I want people to know that you are a tunis freak. Enough said. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Tommy uh, J. Curry, and we hope you'll stay for the for the remaining. Our Common Ground with Janice Graham. Our Common Ground, speaking truth to power and ourselves. Our Common Ground, a higher ground for discourse, discussion, solutions, and ideas. I'm Janice Graham, and I'll be listening for you. Talk, talk, that matters. 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 Transforming truth truth to power, one broadcast broadcast at a time.